Thank you. And let me thank Senator Girardi, all the organizers, young and old, and Chile for imagining such a wonderful Congress and for imagining furthermore that we can address a theme as big as consciousness. In fact, as big as I will try to show you that it includes everything. So I want to touch upon what I am trying to study with my colleagues, which is the most important meaning of consciousness for each of us. So let me define what I'm going to be talking about. The first thing to know is that consciousness is that thing that goes away when you fall into dreamless sleep. When you do so, the entire universe disappears. You, your friends, your home, your country, colors, shapes, sounds, thoughts, emotions, everything. And with that, yourself. There is nothing, absolutely nothing left. And you know that whenever you fall into dreamless sleep. It's really not being. And Neruda, one has to have a tribute to him, said it very beautiful. In fact, it's very hard not to be, except when we fall unconscious. But it's very important to realize then that consciousness is any experience. You saw this slide before from Marcus. It is you wake up and you see in front of you your body, your bed, your room, your books, and the books are in the bookcase, and some are blue and some are red. That is an experience. But it is just as much an experience if you just wake up in the dark with no sound in a foreign place. You don't even know who you are for a moment. It's still an experience. It's being there. So that is consciousness. Consciousness includes self-consciousness. When you think about what is consciousness, how can the brain do it, where does it fit in our place in nature, when you do that, it's a part of consciousness, but it's not all of it. You just go to the museum and you look at this wonderful picture and you don't need to think about it. You just have an experience. So again, it's not just self-consciousness or reflection, it's just having an experience. Well, as beautiful as an experience can be, like this one in Chile, it's not even just experience of the environment that surrounds us. And that's easily proven because you just fall asleep, but now you dream. And a dream is just as much an experience as the most beautiful scene you may see in front of you when you are awake. Finally, I want to indicate a very important thing, which is that we normally judge consciousness because people can talk and tell us what they see and hear and feel, but it can be there even if there is no response to the outside world. Here is a patient who is in so-called vegetative state, implying, which would be terrible given what you heard and will hear from Stefano Mancuso, implying that vegetables are not there at all. Well, such a patient will not respond to anything, not even to a sharp pain. But sometimes, if you go and interrogate their brain by asking questions, asking them to imagine, for instance, to play tennis, that was an experiment that was done not long ago, you see the very same areas in the brain light up as you see in you or me. And so we have to infer that even if that lady is not talking to us, is not doing anything, there is somebody in there, there is somebody home. And as we shall see, that is sometimes very difficult to judge. So now here is a picture that's very similar to what was told to you in Spanish by Marcos. This is Leibniz who said what is the problem for scientists who try to understand how consciousness comes about. So Leibniz has this notion that after all, any machine is just a machine. He took the mill, which was rather complicated. It's a mill, but say you go inside it, and what do you find? You just find wheels and ropes and gear 
that's all you'll find. You'll never find anything more than that. The problem is that if you go inside the brain, even with the most sophisticated tools, what you will find is a machine, a biological machine. You will find lots of neurons. For instance, there are 16 billion neurons here and 60 or more billion neurons in the cerebellum back here. So you find lots and lots of neurons, and you will find a hundred trillion connections among the neurons, synapses. So say you walk inside the brain with a microscope, and what do you find? You find in the bottom right all these little synapses and all kinds of other stuff. It's just full of that. And vesicles that release transmitters and channels. All these minute things that make our brain work, but you will not find a color, you will not find a face, you will not find a mood, and you will not find a thought. In fact, you will not even find yourself in there. It's just a very, very complicated machine. So here is the problem. And the way I see it is, no matter how hard you try, scientists try, you will never be able to squeeze consciousness out of the brain the same way you could squeeze the bile out of the liver. There is no way to do that. One thing is physics, and one thing is phenomenology, what you experience. So the way we think one should go about it is the opposite of what's typically done in science. One has to start with what we have and what we are, which is our own experience, and then from there try and imagine what it takes for the physical world that we know better and better to support our own experience. We, want, we have to look at what consciousness is to be able to imagine what it would take for the physical world of which the brain is part to be able to support it. So this is the work that is being developed in this integrated information theory, or IIT, which really starts from our own consciousness. In fact, strictly speaking, from my own consciousness, the one of each and every one of us, looks at its essential property, which it calls axioms, the ones that are always true of every experience. It then translates them into requirements for the physical substrate, be it a brain or some electronic machine. We'll see about that. And then it makes, of course, predictions. It explains things. And if it is good enough, it will allow us to make good inferences about difficult cases. So I will just briefly give you the flavor of the theory. There is a lot of mathematics in it, but here I just want to say the basic idea again. We start from what we know exists, our own consciousness. That we are sure exists, and that is phenomenal existence. We characterize its properties, and we translate them in the world of physics, in the world of where you can do things, manipulate things, observe things, cut things. That is the world of physics. We translate phenomenal existence into physical existence. But before doing that, we need to figure out what are the essential properties of consciousness, those that are true of every experience, and that cannot be doubted. And very quickly, those, I think, are five, and we'll search long and hard for them. One is that consciousness is for you and for nobody else. Each and every one has his own private experience. That's intrinsicality. Second, that it is structured. I look at the room when I wake up, and there are all kinds of things in it. All kinds of things like my body, the books, the colors, the left and the right, space, the sound, they are all there as part of the structure. It's specific or informative, meaning what you experience right now is that particular experience of me talking in this room, as opposed to trillions and trillions of other things that you could have experienced, but you did not. It's this frame from the movie. It's not any other frame from the movie that is your own life. And it's unified. Every experience is one. You experience it as a whole. You can talk about bits and pieces, but it's always one. And finally, it's definite. 
That means it contains what it contains, not less and not more. You see me and you see me in color. You cannot see me without color. You see all of me in all of this room, not half of it. But on the other hand, you cannot see more than what is in front of your eyes. You cannot see what's behind your eyes. So your consciousness contains what it contains, not less and not more. These properties are so simple that we typically don't really notice them. They are part of everything we are. And even philosophers, in many cases, have not recognized how basic they are. But the theory takes them and says, whatever the physical subset of consciousness might be, and we have reasons to suspect is our own brain, at least for our consciousness, it must satisfy those properties. So much of the work is translating this essential property of experience into requirements for any physical substrate. So a lot of mathematics there, but at the end of all of that, we have ways to actually take, in principle, any physical substrate, a cell, an atom, a brain, a liver, it doesn't matter, and figure out whether it can support consciousness, how much and of which kind. And this is indicated here by showing that an experience, say when you wake up, is identical to something that we call a conceptual structure, which is immense. You know, in the slide, I showed the brain a bit smaller than the experience. In fact, it's only a piece of the brain that supports the experience. But in reality, true reality, I believe, the experience, now that you are working it out, is immensely more in terms of existence than its mere substrate in the brain. So this is difficult to grasp, but it's just as incredible a form as anybody could ever imagine. And we can certainly not yet measure it, not even remotely. However, what we can do is make some predictions and explanations. If the theory is right, well, it should explain why, for instance, consciousness seems to require this part in the back of your cerebral cortex and not other parts of the brain. This is science. You need to explain why here and not there. What's wrong about there? Why the cerebellum, which is in the middle there in the picture, which has even more neurons and just as complicated as in the cortex, doesn't do it at all. I can take out your cerebellum completely. That's more than half of the neurons of your brain. And you are going to have the same experience as before. You're just going to have some little problems in motor coordination but you're not going to change your experience, who you are. And yet it's more than half of the brain. Or other circuits within the brain that are constantly working very hard to make us speak, to make us understand speech, etc. But that's not part of consciousness. It's just the machine is doing its thing. Why is that, that those circuits don't do it? So the theory, in principle, can explain that. It can also explain why consciousness disappears early in the night when you fall into dreamless sleep. It shows that you fragment into many little things and the big experience that is your normal life disintegrates literally into nothing, even though the brain continues to be as active as in wake. That's another paradox. The brain is buzzing along, but you are gone. You must be able to explain that the theory does that, and so it explains why consciousness can indeed disappear. It makes predictions. So it's very important we can test it. It's a scientific theory. And here is, you see transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a way to inject a current by magnetic means into your cerebral cortex, and then record with many EEG channels the response of your brain. I like to say that it's like knocking on the brain and see who answers and how. And the theory makes a prediction that if you are conscious, the response would have high integrated information. A quantity that we call phi, stands for integrated information, cannot be measured really, but it can be approximated. And if we do that, we actually in the early experiment showed that when you are awake and conscious, integrated information is high, as predicted by the theory, when you fall into dreamless sleep and you fragment into nothing, integrated information is low. And when you dream, still asleep, 
but now experience comes back, integrated information is again high. It's a very simple prediction, but it's a very important one, and so far it holds. Not only, but it allows us to begin thinking about practical and clinical applications. This is a recent article which indicates that indeed, in that way, we can perhaps begin to go towards a consciousness meter a way to find out whether there is consciousness or not, say, in a human being, even though we are not able to obtain any response. So this is indicated here. Just take it that after many hundreds of subjects studied this way, whenever the person is conscious, whether awake or dreaming, this index, which measures integrated information, is high whether you are healthy, whether you have a stroke, whether you have all kinds of other problems, it's always high. But if you lose consciousness in dreamless sleep, or when you are anesthetized with the typical anesthetics, where you are gone, you don't exist anymore, this measure is low. So it works in all the cases where we are reasonably sure. But that means we now have something that we can apply to cases where we are not so sure. These so-called vegetative patients, who are not responding at all, is there anybody home or not, like the lady I showed you before. And now we go in and we can see that several of the patients who were thought to be not there are actually almost certainly there. And we can do this without having to ask the patient, without having to require them to do things for us, either behaviorally or in their mind, but just measuring how much integrated information is capable of being generated in their brain. Which leads me to the end, which is, I think, a very crucial point now. If you have a scientific theory that begins to fit with the available evidence, it explains things, predicts things reasonably well, then that should be your best guidance to difficult cases. Difficult cases can be anything from a patient with just a piece of brain working very well, does that mean there is somebody there but only in part? Somebody who just, say, feels pain and nothing else? We can ask whether a newborn baby, or a fetus for that matter, is conscious how much and of what. In principle. In practice, it's still difficult, but in principle, we can. We can ask whether animals very different from us, like an octopus with nine brains. Is it one entity? Is it conscious? Is it divided into nine beings, or only one central being? It's a scientifically answerable question. And we can ask whether Nadine, that was presented to you here by Nadia Talman, whether Nadine might or might not be conscious, no matter how smart she gets to be. Here is one slide of a slightly more technical nature to tell you this important message that I want to leave you with. On the left, you see a very little system like a few neurons with inputs and outputs, sort of a very mini brain. On the right, you see a very simple computer made of logic gates that simulates that brain and produces exactly the same outputs for the same input. So it is functionally equivalent. Now we apply all this mathematics of IIT to see is something there, if these were real little brains and real little computers. And the answer is, in the case of the little brain, because of the way it's built, there is something it is like to be. There is a little bit of consciousness, very little, but phi, integrated information, is not zero. In the case of the computers, that does exactly all the same things the little brain does. There is nothing at all. It doesn't even exist for itself. We can use it, but there is no it. It doesn't have an inner experience. And so this is very important because it follows directly from the theory that any computer, at least of the conventional kind, but that's most computers, any computer, no matter how intelligent it is, and there you see Watson, and there you see a self-driving car, and there you see Nadine again, is not going to be conscious this much, not at all. And even a computer that were to simulate our own brain perfectly would not be conscious at all. You might have a perfectly good conversation with it and think, oh, that's a very sensitive human being. 
but there would be nobody home. So that's a key consequence, a key consequence that means that while until now we have been used, I think rightly in general, to equate consciousness and intelligence. The more you're intelligent, so to speak, the more you're conscious. And we rank animals based on how intelligent they seem to us, and we infer, well, what else did we have? That they are probably conscious, maybe less than we are, but still there. These two examples that you see here, one is Nadine, and especially a future robot, much smarter than Nadine, will be incredibly intelligent, possibly more than we are, but not at all conscious. And vice versa, some things that are just stupid, like an organoid, which is a piece of brain that's now grown in a culture and that does nothing, doesn't speak, doesn't listen. Yet that actually might be conscious, and we better be very careful about that. So let me finish with a quote. It's a long quote, but it was said by uh, Yuval Harari, who wrote this beautiful book, Amadeus, and who was here in the previous edition of the Congress. And he is sort of heralding the coming of this new world, which is the data revolution, where essentially humans may merge with data and become a giant information processing system. The idea is that we are just biological algorithms. We are building very powerful algorithms. We better merge with them and just think that all that exists is really information patterns being processed. That's the idea. And of course, the consequence is that if that's all there is, would anything be lost? He ends his book, in fact, by asking this question. It seems to get him there that that may be the future, but he has some doubts. I think they are very good doubts. This show, Sayonara, is going to start this year in Santiago. It's by Ishiguro, and it tells the story of a robot, a humanoid robot, which is helping a sick lady, and it tells a beautiful story of the interactions among them, and it makes us believe that in the future we will have computers that will act as we do, perhaps even being nicer than we are. And that future maybe is what is expecting us. Well, I'm afraid that if IIT is right, that future is not being at all like that. We will have these things that we may even prefer to our own friends, but there will be absolutely nobody home. So I want to end with a beautiful picture of Torres del Paine and say that, as was sort of paraphrasing Erwin Schrödinger, a great physicist, if such computers were to become more intelligent than we are and possibly take over, apart from all the other problems, the most fundamental existential problem, I think, is that we would leave a world to something that does not exist at all. Thank you very much.